السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين أحمد الله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله You guys are going to make me uh, use my neck 180 degrees, mashallah. You know, I'm going to be uh, exercising that quite a bit today. Mashallah, you're uh, scattered all over the place. Barakallah fikum. Tayyib. So we're continuing our winter break conference, inshallah, with the second majlis. Um, and as you know, we've been talking about the objectives of the sharia. Maqasid al-shari'ah. And this is the second majlis. I pray to Allah Azza wa Jal to make it a majlis mubarak. And I pray to Allah Azza wa Jal to make all those brothers and sisters who are physically with us in this majlis, in this masjid, Masjid Dar al-Quran, Chicago, or who might be tuning in live to make them mubarakin in themselves and in their families. Um, um, I know a lot of you haven't been there with us in the first majlis, so just a quick, very quick um, a recap of the maqasid al-shari'a and what we mean by that. Maqasid al-shari'a or the objectives of the sharia are those broad and universal meanings that are, are objectives of the sharia that Allah Azza wa Jal intended them, wanted to achieve them from the different ahkam of the sharia. You know, there are, there are hundreds of rules in the sharia, right? A lot of ahkam. But what gather them together and what unite them is a set of objectives that Allah Azza wa Jal wanted from the Sharia. And we said this is something that's important to, for every Muslim to understand. Because once you understand these universal objectives of the Sharia, then you're going to come to appreciate the Sharia more. You're going to uh, look at the big picture of the Sharia, right? And it will make you more grateful to Allah wa ta'ala because now you understand you're practicing, you're submitting to the rules of Allah Azza wa Jal and the rules of the Sharia ah with understanding of what Allah Azza wa Jal wanted from that, wanted from these rulings. Why did Allah Azza wa Jal legislate this particular hukum or this particular rule, right, or ruling? The, when you understand what the um, maqsid or what the objective of that, then all of a sudden this should actually revive your heart and make you more encouraged. It's an encouragement, an incentive to come and apply them and submit to the will of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. Like we said, the one who performs the salah has no clue what Allah Azza wa Jal intended behind that is not going to be the same as the one who established the same prayer but with fully aware of what the objectives of this and one of them being the objective of establishing the ubudiyah to Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala servitude to Allah azza wa jal uh, before maghrib uh, toward the end of the last majlis uh, we started talking about some of the mistakes of implementation of these maqasid and these objectives of the sharia ah. We talked about the first one. The first mistake was to actually think that one meaning is an objective of the Sharia ah when it's not. We talked about the equality versus justice. Some people think that equality among all people is an objective when it's not. What is, is al-adl, justice, being fair to everybody according to their characteristics. We also talked about the maqasid have conditions so not to fulfill the conditions would not be achieving the maqasid. We did talk about the maqsad of the ubudiyah to Allah Azza wa Jal. Somebody come to the masjid and say, let's establish this maqsad by uh, performing a ibadah that was not legislated. Something that is not based on the uh, evidence or not legislated by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We say you're not establishing this maqsad of the sharia. Ah. Uh, we also talked about uh, mistakes in ap applying or implementing the objectives of the Sharia. Ah. We talked about Salat al Jumu'ah. Ah. We said one of the objectives of the Sharia ah is to unite people, is to bring them together. Ijtima al Nas, right? Ijtima al Nas for the Friday prayer. Some people may say, but we're in the West, 
we could achieve this we could achieve this in a better way on Sunday because more people are off on Sunday so we can have a bigger gathering so let's move salat al jumuah to Sunday say no because you are actually contradicting a more important a higher priority objective of the sharia which is to maintain it and not alter it and change it preserving the sharia is one of the greatest objectives of the sharia if you move it to sunday you're defying that it is flying uh, in the face of preserving the sharia and this is a mistake in implementing in implementing the objective of ishtima al nas um, this is where i think we stopped um, another mistake when talking about the objectives of the Sharia is when people do things and they think this falls under an objective when it is more befitting that it falls under another objective. Let's take an example. And by the way, those of you who weren't in the, pr in the first majlis, we, everybody has been forewarned. There will be a lot of examples. We teach by example them to make it easier, inshallah. And there will be a lot of ahadith and a lot of ayat that we're going to use. An example, those who commit terrorist acts, they say one of the objectives of the sharia ah is to make the word of Allah Azza wa Jal the highest. I'la kalimatullah. One of the means to do that is a jihad fi sabilillah. To establish jihad fi sabilillah. They say, well, this is one of the ways we're doing that. We're achieving this objective of al jihad fi sabilillah and i'la kalimatullah to make it the highest by performing these um, terrorist acts. We say, no, you're making a mistake. These acts are more befitting under another objective, which is the uh, impermissibility to spell the sacred blood. Sharia came with an objective to preserve life, to preserve the blood of people and not shed them, especially the sacred blood, the sacred life, not to, not to uh, spill the sacred life and blood. And we say that what you guys are doing is more befitting under that, and this is not jihad fi sabilillah, and you're not achieving that maqsad. Um, of preserving life and preserving the sacred life. So this is another example of a mistake of where people go wrong. Another, a similar example, a father could um, beat one of his children harshly and painfully and say, I am achieving the objective of the Sharia ah of giving terbiya to my children. I'm just nurturing them, I'm just educating them and I'm just disciplining them but with beating them harshly. We say you're not, you're mistaken, and you're defying another objective of the Sharia, ah, which is forbidding oppression. And tahrim of dhulm, forbidding oppression, is one of the major objectives of the Sharia. Ah. What you're doing is you're actually inflicting oppression on your own children. And you're not achieving the objective of raising them and disciplining them. You see where one of the mistakes actually you think you're achieving it but you're actually defying and flying in the face of other objectives of the sharia so you're not actually achieving them with that said we're going to move forward to another topic related to al maqasid which is where do we derive these objectives from we said and those who haven't been with us uh, we said before that the objectives are from Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. They are derived from Al Wahi, revelation of Allah Azza wa Jal, Kitab and Sunnah. Now, what are the ways, the methods we can derive them? So it's they're not up to ishtihad. People don't make ishtihad and come up with those objectives, but rather merely derive them. They're there, there are the evidence to those objectives. They're not up to the opinion of the mujtahid and the uh, work of a mujtahid, but rather they are derived from the book and the sunnah of, of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The first source, the first source of those uh, objectives is obviously the book and the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we just said. And in these uh, two sources, Al-Quran, 
and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we see a lot of meanings that are mentioned as an objective, as a, uh, an, the intention behind certain ahkam, certain rules. And these meanings, these universal meanings that have been mentioned as an objective or as a uh, reasoning for, for those ahkam become maqasid al-shari'a, become among the maqasid of the sharia. For example, that's a very common example. Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala says in the ayah of Surah Al-Baqarah, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ all who you believe observing fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you, that you may become pious. That you may become pious. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ This mention of the purpose of the psalm becomes objective of the sharia. So taqwa, so we can say, taqwa, achieving taqwa, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Achieving taqwa is one of the important objectives and maqasid of the sharia because this ruling of fasting fasting is what hukum right fasting during the month of ramadan is a ruling what is the objective what did allah azza wa jal intend from legislating siyam ramadan at taqwa achieving taqwa so this is an objective of the sharia and you know that taqwa is to actually take a protection for yourself from the anger of Allah Azza wa Jal and from his punishment. That would be by submitting to the orders of Allah Azza wa Jal, obeying Allah Azza wa Jal and avoiding his prohibitions. This is how you take a protection. This is how you protect yourself from Allah Azza wa Jal, anger and wrath and his punishment uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's one source. Another source are the various commands and prohibitions in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whenever you see a command in the Quran or in the Sunnah, or a prohibition in the Quran or in the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then you immediately can derive from that that this is an objective of the, of the Sharia. Ah. Let's take an example. I told you a lot of examples. Example, Allah Azza wa Jal says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu abudu rabbakum. Alladhi khalaqakum wal ladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. O mankind, worship your Lord. Worship your Lord. Who created you and those who were before you, that you may become pious. The fact that we see that Allah Azza wa Jal says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena, ya ayyuhal nasu abudu rabbakum, that makes ubudiyatullah. That's the servants, that the servant worship his or her Lord is an objective of the Sharia. Right? That's one of the major actually objectives of the Sharia. We can derive right there from that ayah, from that order. Budu Rabbakum, worship your Lord. That means worshiping our Lord is an objective of the of the Sharia. Notice at toward the end of the ayah says, it says, La'allakum tattaqoon. This relates to what? To number one. Remember, what we discussed where one of the sources of the Sharia is that the reasoning is given behind the gestating of the Sharia. Like, الصيام لعلكم تتقون كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون So this is also we can derive like we did in the first way, in the first number one, that لعلكم تتقون التقوى is also an objective of the, of the Sharia. Another example, Allah Azza wa Jal says, and hold fast all of you together to the rope of Allah and be not divided among yourselves. اعتصموا, hold fast together. That means holding together. الاعتصام and uniting is one of the objectives of the Sharia. اعتصموا. In another ayah, Allah Azza wa says, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ تَفَرَّقُوا وَاخْتَلَفُوا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَهُمُ الْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ And be not as those who divided and deferred among themselves. Be not. So there is a nahi. Nahi from dividing and uh, splitting and disagreeing. 
uh, and be not as those who divided and deferred among themselves uh, after the clear proofs had come to them. It is they for whom there is an awful torment. So we see that there is la takunu nahi from being like those who deferred and split and split and disagree and disunite and divide. In the previous ayah, he says, وَاعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمْعٍ وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا And do not divide. Do not divide. Do not split. That means what? From the, sh from the objectives of the sharia is to unite and have an agreement and not to split. So we see the orders and the prohibitions are also indicate objectives of the sharia and we can. So ijtima al muslimin to, the, for the Muslim to unite is something that we should strive for or to achieve. Why? Because it is an objective of the Sharia. Unity of the Muslim is an objective of the Sharia. We should work to achieve it. Third source where we can derive the objectives is, like we said, maqasid al-Sharia. There are maqasid of the suwar of the Quran. Right? The objective. Every surah in the Quran has maqsad or more has an objective or more and that is how it is written how it is it was revealed yani each and every ayah if you consult if you ponder and reflect upon the suwar you'll you'll see that each surah has one or more objective that was meant from these from the surah and that is why sometimes you see the same story is repeated many times in the quran that's not because of lack of eloquence in the Quran. Not because Allah Azza wa Jal, Ta'ala Allah, Ta'ala Allah. It's not because he's running out of what to say in the Quran. A lot of people think that this is boring. This, why is it repeating over and over again? You notice that every story that was repeated is not repeated in exactly the same way. It is repeated differently. It is mentioned from a different perspective. And what a focus of, of the story when it is repeated, it is a different focus. Why? Because it meets the maqsad of, the, of that surah. It is repeated and mentioned in a different way that helps to achieve the objective of that surah. Now, when you identify those objectives of the surah, these are objectives of the sharia as well. So for example, surah al-ikhlas, we all know that, right? قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ We see in this surah, what Allah Azza wa Jal is intended from that, uh, from that surah is to affirm the oneness of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala and to affirm his self-sufficiency that he doesn't need the creation but rather the creation is in need of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. Allah is Samad, he is in no need of anyone but rather people actually direct, go to him and ask him and invoke him subhanahu wa ta'ala because they have a need for Allah Azza wa Jal. This becomes a maqsad of the sharia. It's the affirming the oneness of Allah Azza wa Jal, knowing that you are insufficient and you are in need of Allah Azza wa Jal is one of the maqasid of the sharia. Surah Musa, the story of Musa alayhi salam. You see it was repeated many times in the Quran including in the Surah of Al-Anbiya. Surah Al-Anbiya has a lot of stories of many messengers and prophets, alayhim salatu wassalam, right? If you study that Surah, what you will see is that its maqsad, its objective, is to show that Allah Azza wa Jal hears the dua of people and he answered them. And that is why you see all of the stories of the messengers and the prophets that are mentioned in Surah Al-Anbiya nar are narrated in such a way that shows us that they made dua to their Lord and Allah Azza wa Jal answered their dua. So one of the objectives of the Sharia ah is that to call upon your Lord and He will answer your dua. That's the maqsad of Surah Al-Anbiya and it is a maqsad of the Sharia ah of Islam. And it goes on and on and on, like the same thing for the rest of the surah. Every surah has a maqsad or more, one objective or more, and these are also objectives of the sharia of Islam. A fourth source of deriving the objectives of the sharia ah is by al-istiqra. We call it al-istiqra in the Arabic language. What is al-istiqra? Al-istiqra is to actually study the text and ponder upon them and investigate them 
and to start noticing in the different specifics of the text that Allah Azza wa Jal is focusing on something. Always reiterating something here and here and here and there and there and there. From all of these together, you deduce and derive that this is a maqsad of the sharia. Let's say for example, Allah Azza wa Jal in many ayat, he orders people to fear him. Allah Azza wa Jal says, إِنَّمَا ذَلِكُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ يُخَوِّفُ أَوْلِيَاءَهُ فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونَ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ It is only shaitan that suggests to you to fear his awliya, his supporters, the awliya of the shaitan. So fear them not, but fear me if you are true believers. So we see that Allah Azza wa Jal in many ayat always telling the servants to fear Allah Azza wa Jal. In other ayat, we, fear, we see that Allah Azza wa Jal is ordering the believers to have good uh, uh, hope and to have hope in Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala and to think well of Allah Azza wa Jal. In many other ayat, Allah Azza wa Jal orders the believer to have good trusting of Allah Azza wa Jal, to rely upon him and to trust all their matters in Allah Azza wa Jal. وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَتَوَكَّلُوا إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ And put your trust in Allah if you are believers indeed. We find a lot of ayat where Allah Azza wa Jal invite and orders the believers to be conscious that Allah Azza wa Jal is watching over them. وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْلَمُ مَا فِي صُدُوا مَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ فَاحْذَرُوا And know that Allah knows what's in your mind, so fear Him. Yani always think, always feels, have this feeling that Allah Azza wa Jal is watching, watching over you. Always be mindful and conscious of that. To many, many other ayat that always link the heart of the servant to Allah Azza wa Jal. Based on all of this, bil istiqra, by noticing and taking all of these ayat together, we can deduce that one of the maqasid uh, al-shari'ah, one of the object, objectives of the sharia is to connect the heart to Allah Azza wa Jal. To fear Him, that the heart fears Allah Azza wa Jal. That the, far, that the heart is hopeful in Allah Azza wa Jal. That the heart trusts Allah Azza wa Jal and rely upon Him. That the heart is always conscious of Allah watching over, over it. Ta'alluq al-qulub billah is one of the objectives of the sharia. That the hearts are attached, to attach the hearts to Allah Azza wa Jal. This is, and this is something that we should each and every one of us should strive to achieve. To attach your own heart to Allah Azza wa Jal and not to anybody else or, not, or nothing else. This is from the object, objectives of the Sharia. Ah. So, this is bil istiqra by researching and looking and pondering and reflecting upon the different texts and noticing that Allah Azza wa Jal and His Prophet in many, many cases is wanting something. Then we say that this is in collectively from all of these. Text, we know that this is one of the objectives of, of the Sharia. Ah. Another source that we can derive from an objective is that if something was, was, was left out during the time of the legislation, during the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when it could have been done, when the need to do it was there, yet it was not done, we know that this is not from the objectives of the Sharia. Ah. The deed for it, it could have been done at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, yet it was not done. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam left it and did not do it. This tells us that this is not something legislated and it is not from the objectives of the sharia. Ah. An example of that is the many, many shapes and forms of worships, of acts of worship that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam could have done. Sahaba could have performed them, yet they did not. Then, and people introduced and innovated them today, we say these are not objectives, these are not legislated things. One of them is some people now, they say, I saw in the dream that we should do this and that. And they derive rules from them. Ahkam. They say, I saw in the dream that we should do this. So this is a hukum that we just introduce from the dreams. From where? From the dreams. We say that's not a source of legislation. Why? 
Because that could have happened during the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could have, saw, could have seen a dream and say, based on the dreams and use the dream to legislate. He never done that. So we say this is not from the sources of legislation and it is not al-manamat and the dreams and the ru'ya are not sources of legislation in the deen of Islam and they are not to be used as a basis for al-ahkam. So this is not from the objectives of the, of the sharia. All understood? If there are no questions moving forward. Now, before we start talking about some specific and individual object objectives, giving a few examples of actual objectives of the Sharia, we're going to talk about three broad areas that are areas of objectives of the Sharia. Yani in other words, put differently, we say that these three areas are some of the areas are three are the three main areas where all the objectives can fall under. If we understand them, then this will help us in understanding the remaining objectives. These are three main goals. The first one is the goal of looking forward toward the Dar al Akhirah, the hereafter. To be Dar al Akhirah, the hereafter, to be your focus. To be something that you, this is what you're always working toward. Toward, that this is what you're actually always uh, 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 first and front. You're always thinking about it, you're always working toward it. You see that all of the ahkam of the sharia ah actually put a focus on that and guide us to keep focusing on Dar al Akhirah. Because we. Because it reminds us, Sharia reminds us that this life is not a place where it will ever last. But this is just a bridge. And what lasts is a Dar al Akhirah. And this is just a, like a channel that will channel us toward a Dar al Akhirah. And you see that so many ahkam, so many rules in the Sharia, ah, actually, their objective is to prepare us toward the Dar al Akhirah. They're legislated in such a way that helps us prepare, helps preparation toward the Dar al Akhirah. For example, Allah Azza wa Jal says, "Bal tu'thirun al hayat al dunya, wal akhirah tu khairun wa abqa." And nay, you prefer this life of this world, although the hereafter is better and more lasting. Which means what? Prepare for it. Keep looking forward toward the Dar al Akhirah because it is better and more lasting. In another ayah, Allah Azza wa Jal says, "Kalla bal tuhibun al ajila, wa tadarun al akhirah." Nay, will not be selected. And I'm sorry. Uh, not will not be resurrected and recompensed, but love the present life of this world and leave the hereafter. You leave the hereafter and you focus on this the word of of this dunya. So the direction is to prepare for a Dar al-Akhirah. Don't neglect and leave the hereafter. In another ayah, Allah Azza wa Jal says, مَنْ كَانَ يُرِيدُ الْعَاجِلَةَ عَجَّلْنَا لَهُ فِيهَا مَا نَشَاءُ لِمَنْ يُرِيدُ ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَا لَهُ جَهَنَّمَ يَصْلَاهَا مَذْمُومًا مَدْحُورًا وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ وَسَعَى لَهَا سَعْيَهَا Whoever wishes for the quick passing of this world, we readily grant him what, he, what we will for whom we like. Then afterward, we have appointed for him hell. He will burn therein disgraced and rejected. And whoever desires uh, the hereafter and strives for it, that means what? Prepare for Dar al-Akhirah. And whoever... Uh, desires the hereafter and strives for it with the necessary effort due for it while he is a believer, then such are the ones whose striving shall be appreciated, thanked, and rewarded by Allah Azza wa Jal. So it is draw, drawing our attention toward the Dar al Akhirah, right? Uh, taking our attention toward the Dar al Akhirah. That doesn't mean you leave this world and you don't look after your benefits. But if you focus on a Dar al-Akhirah, guess what? This dunya will come anyways. Allah Azza wa Jal will grant you this dunya. 
In another ayah, Allah Azza wa Jal telling us about the reality of this life. إِنَّمَا مَثَلُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا كَمَا إِنْ أَنْزَلْنَاهُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ فَاخْتَلَطَ بِهِ نَبَاتُ الْأَرْضِ مِمَّا يَأْكُلُ النَّاسُ وَالْأَنْعَامُ حَتَّى إِذَا أَخَذَتِ الْأَرْضُ زُخْرُفَهَا وَالزَّيَّنَتْ وَظَنَّ أَهْلُهَا أَنَّهُمْ قَادِرُونَ عَلَيْهَا أتاها أمرنا ليلا أو نهارا فجعلناها عصيدا كأن لم تغن بالأمس كذلك نفصل الآيات لقوم يتفكرون والله يدعو إلى دار السلام which is الجنة which is in the hereafter ويهدي من يشاء إلى صراط مستقيم verily the likeness of this worldly life is like the water rain which we send down from the sky so by it it arises a intermingled intermingled produce of the earth of which man and cattle eat until when the earth is clad with its adornments and is beautified and its people think that they have all the powers of disposal over it our command reaches it by night or by day and we make it like a clean a clean mode harvest as if it had not flourished yesterday, thus we do explain the ayat in detail for the people who reflect. Allah calls to the, calls to the home of peace. That is al-Jannah, which is in the hereafter. Dar is salam And guides whom he wills to a straight path. Again, making us look forward to al-Dar al-Akhirah. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَاضْرِبْ لَهُمْ مَثَلَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا كَمَا إِنْ أَنزَلْنَاهُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ فاختلط به نبات الأرض فأصبح هجيما تذروه الرياح وكان الله على كل شيء مقتدرا المال والبنون زينة الحياة الدنيا والباقيات الصالحات خير عند ربك ثوابا وخير أملا and put forward to them the example of the life of this world. It is like the water which we send down from the sky and the vegetation of the earth mingles with it and becomes fresh and green. But later it becomes dry and broken pieces which the wind scatter and Allah is able to do everything. Wealth and children are the adornment of this life of this world. That's the reality. And Allah is, a, 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 and, but the good righteous deeds uh, that last are better with your world, with your Lord for rewards and better in respect of hope. Again, drawing our attention to Dar al Akhirah. Allah Azza wa Jal says in Surah Al Qasas, Tilka Dar al Akhirah, Naj'aluha lilladina la yuriduna uluwan fil ardi wala fasada, wal aqiba tu lil muttaqin. That home of the hereafter, which is paradise, we shall assign to those who rebel not against the truth with pride and oppression in the land, nor do mischief by committing crimes, and the good end is for the pious. Dar al Akhirah. Dar al Akhirah. So this is one broad topic or one broad meaning or category of the objectives of the Sharia is that they draw our attention toward the Dar al-Akhirah. That's what Allah Azza wa Jal wants us to focus on and be conscious of. The Dar al-Akhirah. And this dunya will come anyways. But if you focus on this dunya, you will for sure forget about the Dar al-Akhirah, which is better. And that's what Allah Azza wa Jal wants us. That's an objective. It should be an objective of our, our life that we strive to achieve at Dar al-Akhirah. Another broad category is to give the owners of the rights their rights. أعطي كل ذي حق حقه. Give people and the different, different uh, recipients of rights their rights. إيصال الحقوق. This is an objective. This is like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, أعطي كل ذي حق حقه which is related by Imam al-Bukhari from Hadith Salman al-Farisi radiyallahu anh. So, so you should give to everyone his due. And in the <coughs> text of the Sharia, we see a lot of examples of that. A lot of text that actually uh, clarify to us what are the different rights for different people, what, who has what right, and encourage us and guide us to give them their rights. Allah Azza wa for example, says in Surah An-Nisa, excuse me. Abu Yasir, وَاعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا وَبِذِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَى وَالْمَسَاكِينِ وَالْجَارِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْجَارِ الْجُنُبِ وَالصَّاحِبِ بِالْجَنْبِ وَابْنِ السَّبِيلِ وَمَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ مَنْ كَانَ مُخْتَالًا فَخُورًا Worship Allah and join none with Him in worship and do good to parents. These are rights. 
we should give them their rights. Uh, and do good to parents, kinsfolk, orphans, and masakin, the poor, and the neighbor who is near of kin, the neighbor who is a stranger, and the companion by your side, the wayfarer, and those whom your right hands uh, possess, yani the slaves under you. Verily, Allah does not like such as are proud and boastful. We give these rights, and this is something that is important. So we should give, give each one their due. We give these due out of what? We give these rights to, their, to the one who, are, to, who they are due to out of obedience to Allah Azza wa Jal, not out of reciprocity. Yani if, they give them, if they give us our rights, then we give them their right, we reciprocate. This is very important. So one of the objectives of the Sharia ah is to give everyone his due. We do it out of obedience to Allah Azza wa Jal, even if we don't get our rights. Yani the wife gives the rights of the husband that Allah Azza wa Jal gave to him, even if he mistreat her. The kids, the children, treats their parents with dignity and birr and observe those rights to their parents even if their parents mistreat them even if they don't give them the rights that Allah Azza wa Jal gave to them we give that not because we are not interested in these rights not because we are too weak and we are foregoing these rights but rather because we are looking at a Dar al-Akhirah and we want the reward from Allah Azza wa Jal. So we do them out of obedience and then let's ask Allah Azza wa Jal our rights. That's actually a very important matter to keep in mind. Allah Azza wa Jal says, and what indicates that we should give the rights even if we don't get our own rights, is the encouragement throughout the Sharia ah to forgive and uh, uh, to forgive the people who may have actually taken our rights or may have oppressed us. Allah az, or Rasulullah sallallahu says, مَا زَادَ اللَّهُ عَبْدًا بِعَفْوٍ إِلَّا عِزَّا Allah augments the honor of one who forgives. And this is a hadith in Sahih Muslim from hadith Abi Huraira رضي الله So the more you forgive others, the more Allah Azza wa Jal will augment and increase your honor by forgiving. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the ayah of Surah Ali Imran when talking about the Jannah to actually hasten and work toward it. He said, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ أُعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ What do they do? These mutaqeen, what do they do? الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ والكاظمين والغيظ والعافين عن الناس والله يحب المحسنين and march forth in the way that will lead to forgiveness from your Lord and for paradise as wide as the heavens and the earth prepared for المتقين the pious who those who spend in Allah's cause in prosperity and in adversity who repress anger and who pardons people which means that they have wronged them right so they didn't get their right they oppress them either, either by denying their rights or by inflicting harm on them or whatever it is, right? Either way, they did not get their right. Yet, you forgive and you give the rights that other people have on you out of obedience to Allah Azza wa Jal. And Allah loves al muhsinin those who do ihsan to other people, do good to people. It couldn't have been clearer this couldn't have been clearer than the story of Al-Ifq. You know the story of Al-Ifq where Umm al muminina Aisha was accused wrongly in her honor. And the story of Abu Bakr and his relative, uh, uh, <coughs> Mistah, Mistah ibn Uthatha. Mistah ibn Uthatha was one of the relatives of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is his maternal uncle. And Mistah was a poor person. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq used to spend on him, give him money, support him. Mistah radiallahu an, and Allah forgave him, is one of the men who accused Ummul Mu'minina Aisha, who spread this, these rumors of, of accusing Ummul Mu'minina Aisha's honor. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa lashed him, the qisas, which is of erroneously or mistakenly, wrongly accusing one's honor. 
He was among the, the ones whom, Allah, whom Rasulullah وسلم, lashed, punished by lashing. Lashing of Qadf uh, al Muhsanat. When Abu Bakr saw that, he made an oath by Allah Azza wa Jal that he will not support him anymore. Imagine somebody accused the, your daughter's honor and the wife of Rasulullah Sallallahu So he said, I will not support him anymore. By Allah, I will not support him. He didn't say I will beat him. He's not like I'm going to oppress him. He just merely said, I won't give him money anymore. خلص, that's it. Allah Azza wa Jal reminded Abu Bakr that to forgive and don't, don't do that and continue giving him. SubhanAllah. Somebody who accused your own daughter's honor. Allah Azza wa Rasulullah Sallallahu I'm sorry, Allah Azza wa Jal guided Abu Bakr that don't do that but forgive and keep giving them, give, keep giving him even if he misoppressed you in your daughter's honor, right? He wronged you. Yet we forgive for the sake of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, out of obedience to Allah Azza wa Jal who guided us to forgive. And that is why, and, and Allah Azza wa Jal documented this, or actually told us about this. He said, وَلَا يَأْتَ لِأُولُوا الْفَضْلِ مِنْكُمْ وَالسَّعَةِ أَنْ يُؤْتُوا أُولِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَالْيَعْفُوا وَالْيَصْفَحُوا أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ And let not those among you who are blessed with graces and wealth swear not to give this was revealed in abu Bakr. although it applies to any person who is in the same situation but it was revealed primarily for abu Bakr because he made a sw he swear by allah Azza wa he made an oath by allah Azza wa that i'm not gonna spend on mistah anymore so allah Azza wa guided him he said let not those among you who are blessed with graces are capable they're they're yani wealthy uh, with graces and wealth, swear not to give any sort of help to their kinsmen, al masakin and those who left their homes for Allah's cause. Let them pardon and forgive. Do not, do you not love that Allah forgive you? When this ayah was revealed, he said, Abu Bakr Siddiq, he said, Bala, wa, bala ya Allah, indeed ya Allah, we love to be forgiven. Ala tuhibbuna an yaghfir Allahu lakum? Qala na'am nuhibbu an yaghfir Allahu lana. We do love that Allah Azza wa Jal forgive us. And Allah is oft forgiving and most merciful. So uh, he actually uh, continued and went back and continued spending on mistah, even though he has wronged him. طيب. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَيْسَ الْوَاصِلُ بِالْمُكَافِئِ وَلَكِنَّ الْوَاصِلَ الَّذِي إِذَا قُطِعَتْ رَحِيمَهُ, رحيمه وَصَلَهَا and this hadith is in Sahih al-Imam al-Bukhari. The person who perfectly maintains the ties of kinship is not the one who does it because he gets recompensed by his relatives. It has become widespread among the Muslim that if you have kinship, if they visit you, you go visit them. If they stop visiting you, then you don't visit them. Yani it's, you reciprocate. You visit them once, you visit them twice. You see that they're not reciprocating. They don't visit you pay you a visit back, then you stop visiting them. And you uh, discon or you uh, cut these ties. This is not maintaining the kinship. Rasulullah is saying this is not the maintenance of kinship, but rather maintaining the kinship is that you maintain it and connect this kinship, relationship of kinship, even when they severe it. So you don't just reciprocate, but the one who truly maintains the bonds of kinship is the one who persists in doing so, even if the latter has severed the ties of kinship with him. Even further, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith which is related by Imam Ahmad and Al-Darami, he said, Afdalu sadaqat the best of the sadaqah, the best of the charity. Allahu Akbar, what is it? Afdalu sadaqat ala dhirrahim al-kashih al the best of the uh, uh, the best of the sadaqa is the one that you give to the one who is of kinship and hates you. Ajib. Somebody you have a kinship hates you. He carries enmity toward you. Rasulullah is saying the best sadaqa is to give it to that particular kinship. Why? Because it, the scholars have said that it actually gathers two things in, in it. First you're helping your own relative and second you're irritating the shaitan by uniting by maintaining that kinship he doesn't like that forgiving 
and doing what Allah Azza wa Jal ordered you to do. So you do that for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal, out of obedience to Allah Azza wa Jal, not because he is giving, the other party is giving you your right. The right of kinship is that he loves you, right? And maintain that kinship. He's not doing that. He even ha hates you. He carries enmity toward you. So you're not getting your right. But you still give him his right or her right out of obedience to Allah Azza wa Jal. إعطاء الحقوق out of obedience to Allah تبارك وتعالى طيب and Allah عز وجل says ادفع بالتي هي أحسن السيئة بالتي هي أحسن السيئة نحن أعلم بما يصفون repel evil with that which is better we are best acquainted with things they utter and Allah عز وجل says ادفع بالتي هي أحسن فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةٌ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌّ حَمِيمٌ Repel the evil with one which is better than verily he between whom and you there, are en there, is, there was enmity as though he was a close friend. And the benefit out of that will outweigh is great, tremendous. You give them their right, whoever Allah Azza wa Jal gave right, you give them their right, even if they don't reciprocate and give you your right. And you hope for the reward from Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. The third, so this was the second broad category of the objectives of the Sharia. To give everybody their due, even if they don't reciprocate and give you your rights. The third one is to strive to act upon erasing the sins. No matter what we do. No matter how keen we are and careful about obeying Allah Azza wa Jal and being muttaqi and being pious and being muhsin, right? And observing the rights of Allah Azza wa Jal upon us, we're going to err, we're going to wrong ourselves, we're human beings. Sharia guides us to act and to strive to try to erase and be forgiven for those sins that we, we, we do. We're going to do that, no matter how careful we are. So whatever that is between you and Allah Azza wa Jal, and whatever between you and other people, right? Whatever sins you have toward Allah Azza wa Jal, toward other people, you should strive and try to erase their sins by undoing them and be forgiven for them. This is takfir al sayyiat And you see this is one of the maqasad of the sharia. It guides us. It asks us to strive toward to achieve that goal to be forgiven. That's for our own sake, to be forgiven. From maqasad al-sharia is to try to be forgiven, to strive for forgiveness of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. One of the ways of doing that is all of the establishing of the different acts of obedience, of, of uh, uh, ibadah. When you pray, when you fast, when you do the different actions of ibadah, all of them have the impact of erasing the sins. The prayers erase the sins. The Jumu'ah to the Jumu'ah erases the sin. Fasting the month of Ramadan erases the sins, right? Fasting the day of Arafah erases the sins. Fasting the day of Ashura erases the sins, right? Salawat al-Khams, in between them they erase the sins, etc., etc. So you notice that Allah Azza wa Jal always direct us to try to do the things that will erase our sins, to be forgiven for them. Allah and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says in the great hadith, وَأَتْبِعِ السَّيِّئَةَ الْحَسَنَةَ تَمْحُهَا And follow up a bad deed with a good deed which will wipe it out. And this hadith is in uh, Sahih, uh, 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 Imam Al-Tirmidhi, Sunan Al-Tirmidhi. So we see that there is a great emphasis on, on doing that. And we see that there is a lot of text in the Sharia ah that actually uh, guide us to seek repentance, to, uh, to do repentance and to seek forgiveness from Allah Azza wa Jal and to do good to the ones, even the ones who have wronged us. إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتِ يُذْهِبْنَ السَّيِّئَاتِ ذَلِكَ ذِكْرَى لِلذَّاكِرِينَ Verily the good deeds remove the evil deeds. That is a reminder for the mindful among you. Type any person who we, we may have wronged in the majalis, in the gathering, we talked upon them, we backbited them, we you know, spread rumors against them, we wronged them in any way, shape or form, then we should tr tr try to undo that and get forgiven for that by seeking forgiveness from that person, right? And as we backbited that person or talked badly about them, 
than in the same majalis to praise them and show their goodness and their uh, characteristic, good, good uh, characteristics and features and to talk nicely about them in the, in the hope of undoing what we've done before, which is wronging them. Because Rasulullah says, Sibabul Muslimi Fusuq, abusing a Muslim is Fusuq, is evil doing. So, like we abused, may, we may have abused certain people or reviled, defamed, then we, we bring, uh, we actually praise them and mention the good aspects of these people uh, and their good qualities and features. Tayyip. How are we doing in time? We have three minutes on the Three minutes, Allahu Akbar. What can you do in three minutes? <laughs> طيب. Is it possible at all to maybe delay it by 10 minutes? Exceptionally, or you think we should pray on time? We can do it. Yeah. What say you? Let me think. Let me think. <laughs> so you're going to take 15 minutes to think about it, right? Cool. Yeah, he's going to spend the 15 minutes that we need in just thinking, should we delay it or not? Can we do that? Everybody okay, okay with that? 10 minutes? 6, 10. طيب. Alhamdulillah, barakallah fikum. Moving forward, <laughs> there are some rules for the objectives of the Sharia. Ah. There are things, conditions that are rules that are related to the Sharia ah that we're going to take, we're going to briefly talk about. Maqasid al Sharia. Ah. One of the rules of Maqasid al Sharia ah is to purify the hearts of the servants and attach it to Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. Purifying the hearts and attach it to its Lord, Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. Because when we do that, when we purify our hearts, when we take that as an objective, when we purify our hearts, then all our matters will work out to the best. Will work out for the best. That is why Allah Azza wa Jal says, Ya ayyuhan Nabi, قُلْ لِمَنْ فِي أَيْدِيكُمْ مِنَ الْأَسْرَى إِنْ يَعْلَمِ اللَّهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ خَيْرًا يُؤْتِكُمْ خَيْرًا مِمَّا أُخِذَ مِنْكُمْ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ O Prophet, say to the captives that are in your hands, these were people who were fighting Islam, fighting the Prophet and the Muslimin. Say to those captives that are in your hand, if Allah knows any good in your hearts, purify your hearts. Then he will give you something better than what was taken from you and he will forgive you. Allahu, ab Allahu Akbar. They were just fighting the Muslim prophet, fighting the messenger of Allah Azza wa Jal. They are trying to extinguish the light of, the, of Islam, of the deen. Then Allah Azza wa Jal yet says, if he knows, if you purify your heart sincerely to Allah Azza wa Jal, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows that in your heart, goodness in your heart, he will give you better than what was taken from you and he will forgive you. All the matters will be, will turn out for the best. In another ayah, uh, actually this is why one, what, some of the more frequent dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we're talking about purifying the heart and keep it steadfast. One of the frequent dua of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that he used to say, Ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. O changer of the hearts, make my heart firm upon your religion. Keep it steadfast, keep it pure, keep it sincere to you. You are the one who changes the hearts, keep it fixed on, on your religion. Purifying the hearts. From the dua of the believers, رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِغْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا وَهَبْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً O Lord, let not our hearts deviate from the truth after you have guided us. Keep it pure and keep it sincere. And grant us mercy from you. Verily, uh, I'm sorry, and grant us mercy from you. In a hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, and this is in uh, Sahih al-Imam Muslim, he said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَنظُرُ إِلَى صُوَرِكُمْ وَأَمْوَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ يَنظُرُ إِلَى قُلُوبِكُمْ وَأَعْمَالِكُمْ Verily, Allah does not look to your faces and your wealth, but He looks to your heart and to your deeds. Purification of the heart. He looks at your heart, not how you look and the look, uh, color of your skin, how tall, how short, how beautiful, etc., etc. And if the people achieve this meaning, the purification of the heart, and they keep working on achieving that, of that objective, 
then you will see that all the matters of the people will turn out for the best. It will become as they like and will be good for them, for the person, for the heart that fears Allah Azza wa Jal. There is no way it can cheat on other people. The heart that fears its Lord will never cheat and will never uh, steal and will never harm others and wrong others. And if the heart is full of love uh, for Allah Azza wa Jal and for the other people like Allah Azza wa Jal has told us, you love other people out of obedience and drawing closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. You love the believers and you love goodness for everybody else. Then no question about it, then we will become merciful with others and we will become compassionate. We will help the needy. We will help the less fortunate and we will help out the oppressed against the oppressor and we will take care of the orphans and the, the ones who are in need. Why? Out of obedience to Allah Azza wa Jal because our hearts are pure. If this is the state of our hearts, then you will see all of our deeds and all of our, our actions and our matters will fall in, in line as Allah Azza wa Jal wants. The second rule of the objectives of the Sharia is to have the wrong, the, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, to have the right understanding to look at matters of this life and give them the right level. Yani to have the, to understand everything as it is, to understand what life is, to understand all the matters of this life. Some people have a misunderstanding of the matters and this is what leads them to deviate. But the believers, and Allah Azza wa Jal made this as an objective to always correct your understanding, to have the correct understanding of this life and how you look at others to correct that understanding. For instance, one of the common examples is how we look at money. How you look at that money and what money represents. To a lot of people, they, money represents the honor, represents the happiness they think if they get more money if they strive to become richer and wealthier then this is what's going to get them happier it will buy them happiness and they couldn't be more wrong they couldn't be more wrong than that they think that if they amass wealth and money then this is what's going to get them a higher people will look them will look up to them and they will have a more gain more honor and uh, social uh, status and will make will get them respect from other people but we look that the sharia looks at the money and the wealth in general in a different way so one of the objectives of the sharia is to correct your understanding how you see money for example and look at it at the right way as the sharia wants from us the mere Amassing of the wealth and money in itself, if you don't use it in the right way, it could be the, the it could be so evil upon you, and it could actually be a, uh, 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 a leg, uh, it's, it, it will be a uh, yani something that will be you will be, become accountable for, and you will be brought to recompense for it. It will become part of your recompense on the day of judgment. But if you use it for goodness. And if you use it to do ihsan and do good and help others and yourself, then it becomes something that is good and encouraged. This is the right understanding and the right view of wealth and money in general. And that is why Allah Azza wa Jal says in the ayah of, Tur of Surah At-Tawbah, فَلَا تُعْجِبْكَ أَمْوَالُهُمْ وَلَا أَوْلَادُهُمْ إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ بِهَا فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَتَزْهَقَ أَنفُسُهُمْ وَهُمْ كَافِرُونَ so let not their wealth or their children amaze you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In reality, Allah's plan is to punish them with, their thi with these things in the life, in this life, of the, in the life of this world, and that their souls shall de depart while they are disbelievers. So it was something not good for them, but rather it was a fitna and fascination and test and trial, and they will be brought to accountability toward it. It didn't help them. Their money did not help them. In another ayah, Allah Azza wa Jal says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا 
ينفقون أموالهم ليصدوا عن سبيل الله فسينفقونها ثم تكون عليهم حسرة ثم يغلبون والذين كفروا إلى جهنم يحشرون Verily those who disbelieve and spend their wealth to hinder from the path of Allah and so they will continue to spend it but in the end it will become an anguish for them a liability it's going to be a liability against them on the day of judgment then they will be overcome and those who disbelieve will be gathered unto hell wal'iyadhu billah also with respect to the money rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said ayyukum mal warithihi ahabbu ilayhi min malihi qalu ya rasulullah ma minna ahad illa maluhu ahabbu ilayhi qala fa inna malahu ma qaddam wa mal wa mal warithihi ma akhar uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked the Sahaba, who of you loves the wealth of their heir, yani those who will inherit their heritage, their money, uh, who loves the wealth of their heir more than his own wealth? The companion said, O Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there is none of us but loves his own wealth more than the wealth of their heir. He alayhi salatu wasalam, correcting their understanding. Which money is the heir's money and which one is your money? Most people will think that if you preserve your money and amass it, try building your wealth, then this is your money. Rasulullah is correcting that understanding, how you view and how you see that. He said the wealth, his wealth is that which he spent, not what you amass, but that which he retains belongs to the heir. So you say you love your own money, then spend it in the cause of Allah Azza wa Jal, right? And this is what brings you benefit. This is the correct view and understanding. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and we'll finish by this and stop, or do we have a little, a few more minutes? Khalas, we'll stop at this, inshallah. Rasul, we'll mention this hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we'll stop at that. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in this hadith, which is in uh, uh, Imam al-Tirmidhi, Sunan al-Tirmidhi, he said, man asbaha minkum aminan fi sarbi. في بعافا في جسده عنده قوت يومه فكأنما حيزت له الدنيا the one among you who wakes up secure in his property يعني he feels safe in his home doesn't have to be castles doesn't have to be mansions but you feel you have the sense of security and safety in your own home no matter how modest it is and healthy in his body and has his food for the day. Just the food for the day. It is as if the whole word were brought to him. Allahu Akbar. That is the correct view. Now, who will have a more sense of satisfaction and will have the correct view, right? The CEO of Amazon or this person whom Rasulullah described. Those, the more they, money they have, the more anxiety they will, and the more time they spend every single day and night, how I am going to reach the next level, the next hundred billion dollars. Now I, I, I cross the hundred billion dollars. Now I am going to work to cross the two hundred billion dollars. I'm already ri the, richer per the richest person on earth, but I'm not satisfied. I want to keep maintaining and I'm going to keep am amassing that and keep working toward it. Is that the one who is safe and secure and feel the satisfaction of, of life? No. Rasulullah sallallahu and Allah azza wa jal are correcting our view. That's what a lot of people see it. That's a lot, how a lot of people see it. I want to become the richest or, or, or you know, be, uh, uh, make it on the list of billionaires and millionaires. That's not the correct view of how we should see money. If it doesn't work for us, then we are working for it. And it's, it will be a liability on the day of judgment. This is the correct view and this is the view of the Sharia ah, and this is one of the objectives of the Sharia ah, is to have the correct understanding of matters of this dunya. You, you, you view this dunya the right way. You view the money the right way. You view the fascinations of this life the right way. This is the objectives of the Sharia ah, and we're running out of time inshallah. We'll stop here and we'll inshallah resume after Salat al-Isha. So stay with us for the third majlis where we're going to start talking about the specific objectives of the Sharia. Ah. هذا والله أعلم وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وإياكم.